You are not going to grow by studying the Bible. You are well, not I, I'm sorry to have left you in such a kind of tense place word. last time, but I think it was you an important place for us to get to and for us to kind of pause at. And actually, when we come back now, to just remind ourselves of. Jesus has met with uh, Martha. He's met with Martha because of the death of Lazarus, and it's been a fairly, uh, shall we say, impertinent uh, interview. It's not been at all like, although it's got echoes, I think you would have heard, of, of, of Jesus' mother uh, at, the, at the turning of the water in wine, into wine at Cana. There's this kind of demandingness in her voice that's basically said, look, if you would have been here, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But Jesus purposely had stayed away, and he told the disciples that he purposely stayed away in order that they might all believe. Because, you see, there is this problem that is about moving us as believers from being people who believe in God to people who have the faith of God. I tell you something, there's a big difference between believing in God and believing God. There's a big difference between having faith in God and having the faith of God operating in you. And Jesus is wanting to move this community of people to become a community of people that have the faith of God, that can move in the same powerful way that he himself moves in such an effortless way. And Jesus has made this statement to Martha that is kind of completely bypassed her. He said to her, listen, I am the resurrection. He asked her a very pointed question. Do you believe, Martha, do you believe that Lazarus can r rise. And I said, yes, of course. I know he's going to come back at the resurrection. I understand that. But poor Martha is a deeply pragmatic woman. Do you remember when Jesus comes to visit the house of Martha and her sister Mary? The Bible simply says that Mary sits by the feet of Jesus, just kind of swooning around him, whereas Martha is busy hoovering up around him. I and mean, the Bible says that Jesus describes her and says she's distracted by so many things. Many of us are. There are a myriad of things that distract us. There are a myriad of things. Because we get caught down into the practical, we get caught down into the immediate, we get drawn, kind of sucked in to this, uh, this, this visible world of pragmatic dealings. But Jesus wanted to say to her, Martha, newsflash, I am the resurrection. It's not that your brother will rise again at the last day. That's not the point. That's not the great news of the gospel. Oh, it's news, but here's the news. Why will he rise at the, at the last day? Why will he be risen? He'll be risen because of the resurrection. And Martha, the resurrection isn't the date that you've got to put in your calendar. The resurrection is not an event. The resurrection is a person. I am the resurrection. And Martha is like... Wow. And as I said, she, she can't see through to that. She doesn't have what it takes at this stage. That's not even above her pay grade. That's not even worth saying that. She, it's beyond her comprehension. You see, Martha is waiting for some unknown day. All of Christianity is waiting for some unknown day. All of Christianity gets itself tied up in knots about rapture and post-millennialism, pre-millennialism. Are we going to go up? Is he going to come down? How's it going to work out? Listen. It's here now. And that's the point. The resurrection's a person. That's what Jesus wants to say. And she just she, she had a deeply unsatisfactory interview. But this is no stupid woman. Let's let's hear what she does. She she simply can't penetrate Jesus. She can't get him to give her the kind of answer she wants. Because religion just wants the answer it wants. Well, that's all religion is about. That's all belief is about. Belief is about a, a set of principles, a set of laws, a set of religions, that if I apply these principles and do these things, I will get this outcome. And she doesn't have the mind that take her on beyond religion and into the realm of grace, because religion is that makes you feel secure. Grace and faith makes you feel deeply insecure, and she doesn't like feeling insecure. And so we read in the 29th verse of uh, the 11th chapter here, we read, actually, let's read you from the 27th verse. She said, <coughs> excuse me, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. I do believe that. But you don't think I don't believe that. I completely believe you're the, you're the Christ who's coming into the world. But what she's currently missed is that he is the resurrection. She's missed that. And when she said these things, she went and called her sister. 
Now this is really interesting. So she says, you know what, uh, I'm done with this nonsense. You stay right there, I'm going to go get my sister. Now, the scripture says that Jesus hadn't yet come to the village. He was still in the place where he met Martha. Now the Jewish mourners, remember, they 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 uh, are sitting there, sort of doing their, their 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 kind of ritual mourning thing, chanting their chants and all the rest of it, so saying their soothing prayers. And we see this. Verse twenty-eight. Watch, it's very interesting. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying, "The teacher is here, and he's calling for you." Now watch that. She see she's cute. She goes to see the sister in private, Mary, and she says, Oh, Mary, um, the teacher, Rabbi, he's calling for you. He wants you. Now, this is very interesting. She's thinking to herself, this man's ridiculous. This, this, this man talks in these ridiculous riddles about resurrections and whatever else it might be. And you know what? I'm just not getting that. But this air-headed sister of mine, uh, this seer of seers, who just sits around the place when Jesus comes to visit us, instead of getting on with the business of building the kingdom and cleaning up the house and sorting stuff out and making the preparations, maybe if I send this air-headed sister of mine down there, then she might be able to go and talk some sense in because you know what, she'll bat her eyelids and do a little, you know, kumbaya, my lord thing, and maybe he'll kind of do something for her, I don't know. So, he, 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 now it's interesting because Jesus didn't call Mary. And, and Martha was smart enough to know that Mary wouldn't go unless she was called because Mary had been schooled in the ways of the Spirit. She would do nothing in her own initiative, only that which she saw the Father doing was she do. But she now thinks she has this invitation. She thinks she's been summoned by the Lord. So because she thinks she's been summoned, she runs out the house. Now I told you that Mary and Martha, apart from being the, uh, the, 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 the female version of the prodigal son and the elder brother, and I think that's a very nice fit by the way, are also the New Testament version of Rachel and Leah. Now, you see Leah's problem is that she knows, that, her, that she absolutely knows how much uh, her husband Jacob, uh, who she was obviously was duped into marrying her, loves her. And she thinks that, this is what she thinks, she thinks that Jacob doesn't love me, but he loves her. So if I get her to go and petition for us, then I'll get some benefit out of it. And it's, it's an interesting twist because, you see, Mary always, always, always just wants to be in the presence of God. That's the only thing she's interested in. So she runs out of the house, and as she runs out of the house, having understood that the Master is calling for her, she runs down to where Jesus is. All of the mourners suddenly think, oh my gosh, what's happening? So they kind of quickly rush out after her. So now we've got this kind of gaggle of people sprinting up the road, hitching up their skirts, chasing after, after Mary. Mary arrives at where Jesus is. Now let's listen this time around to what happens now. Because this is a significant point. The Bible says, when Mary arrives, she prostrates herself in worship. Now she's going to give the same speech as her sister. Remember what we said last time about communication. Communication is mainly non-verbal. 7% uh, words. 38% is tone, 55% body language. So let's look at the body language to start with. She is prostrate in worship, and there she is in, before the Lord, and she says, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. I, 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 I know he wouldn't have died if you would have been here. Now this is a voice of regrets. This is a voice of remorse. It's not a voice of accusation. It's not a voice of demanding this. It's not a voice of, you know, it can't be helped. It, 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 there was nothing you could do. It, it, it's a voice that just simply says, I know if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. Now, watch this. Jesus is deeply, deeply moved because of this, this interview he's having with Mary. And he's moved to tears, not, not, uh, how shall I say this to you? It's not that he's weeping, it's not, he's not, you're going to hear the shortest verse in the scripture in a minute, Jesus wept. And what he's weeping about is not the content of the conversation, 
It's not uh, Martha's demanding this, not Mary's uh, disappointment, but yet her, her sense of saying, I know, Lord, I know it couldn't have been helped. I know you'd have been here if you could be here because you're a good God. You see, there's those two, there's those two polarities, aren't there? On the one hand, the, the religious, the, you've got this sort of kind of almost like religious demanding mind. But then you've got the other hand is this other sense of like, well, you know, uh, obviously God wouldn't, if God, God could have done something about it, he would have done something about it. And you've got this strange tension. And I often wonder about this, that you end up with this rather curiously anemic God. You either have a God that could have done something about it, didn't want to, or you have a God who could have done something about it, but could, who wanted to do something about it, but couldn't. And it kind of feels like Martha is saying, you're a God who could have done something about this, but you obviously didn't want to. And Mary is seeming to say, you're a God who I think wanted to do something about it, but you couldn't. And actually, it's that limitation that causes Jesus to weep. Because Jesus doesn't weep because the law doesn't have faith. Jesus weeps because grace doesn't have faith. You see, because for, for, for John, law and grace represent uh, two very different trajectories. Nobody expects law to have faith. Law is about works, but grace is about faith. You see, the truth is that even here, grace cannot believe what it cannot see. He doesn't weep for the religious mind. He weeps for Mary. All that Mary had seen, all that Mary had understood about the intimacy of the Spirit. Where, where have you laid him, Jesus says. Where is he? Now let's pick up the text. Alright. So I'm in John chapter 11. And now I'm here in, in verse 24. And Jesus said, Where have you laid him? And they, they said, now the crowd said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, Oh, look how he loved him. Oh, but some said, Could he not who opened the blind eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Like, what is that with that? This guy can, if this guy's the Messiah, why did he let his friend die? And then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. Now watch, 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 watch. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. This motif is, is a strong one. There's a stone that's blocking the way to the cave. Uh, we're going to see this in the resurrection, so I'll park it for the moment. But my goodness, this is a strong, this is a strong point. Now watch. So, uh, so Jesus said to him, um, watch. Take away the stone. Now look. <laughs> Hallelujah. Take away the stone. There is a stone that is blocking Lazarus in the grave. That is keeping him bound in the grave. And Jesus wants to take away the stone. Uh, you'll see that, as I said in the resurrection story, it's, it's so much more powerful. So, tempted as I am to go and get hold of it here, I think I'm going to park it and let me, let me jump on. Um, now, Martha said, watch, Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time will not there be an odour? He's been in, Ill in other words, he's going to stink to high heaven, for goodness sake, you can't open the tomb. What will the neighbours think? Keep it closed, it's going to smell. And Jesus says, did I not tell you? Did I not tell you? If you believed, you would see the glory of God. Now, let me, let me rephrase this for you. Did I not say to you, if you have faith, you'll see the glory of God? Now watch. And so they took away the stone. And Jesus, it says, lifted up his eyes to heaven. Do you know, I often used to, I, I, I'm like all of us, you always think when you read, read those verses, and Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven. You have this kind of very reverential picture, don't you, of Jesus saying, Oh, Father, and sort of raising his hands and, and doing the, the, you know, the Holy Spirit thing that we all do as evangelical Christians. But let me tell you something, Jesus is not an evangelical Christian. 
when Jesus raises his eyes to heaven, he goes, oh, and Jesus is Jewish. He's like, oh, vey, what is wrong with these people? Father, he says, and he cries out, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew this always, that you always hear me. But I say this on account of the people standing around here, that you, they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, the scripture says, Lazarus, come out. The man who, who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips. And his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, Unbind him, and let him go. Well, we'll talk about the significance of that next time. But for now, may I pray that the stone is rolled away from your situation, and you would hear the word of the Lord. Come on out. God bless you. Bye-bye.